So I want to launch into this by setting out two questions. The first question is, what regulations apply to me or my institution that, as a financial institution? That's, that's the first question that I'm putting forward. The second question is, once I've interpreted that regulation, how do I know it's right, the way I've interpreted it? Is it in spirit to what the regulators are asking me? So those two questions, please keep in the back of your mind. And I'll try and frame them in the context of our industry spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, you have the large, well-established financial institutions. At the other end, you have a vibrant fintech market, smaller niche boutiques. So at the large, uh, in, uh, end of the spectrum, you have your big banks, you know, Deutsche Bank being one example, the big universal banks, Citibank, JP Morgan, etc., where historically, well over a decade now, they've had big elaborate corporate functions who have had to, you know, deal with a plethora of very complex and increasingly more complex regulations. Um, to name a few, CCAR, US Basel III, FRTB, MIFID, the names go on. And just to put it out there, this is a tax for these uh, organizations. It's not a revenue generation opportunity for these organizations, but it isn't, it's a critical aspect of their business to be compliant and to be able to uh, be in that particular jurisdiction and do the businesses that they need to do. So it is an overhead, however, and a huge cost to these organizations. So that's one end of the spectrum. You have the other end where you have a vibrant, fintech market that's increasingly growing. They're very nimble in nature compared to the um, bigger, well, more well-established institutions. However, they do have a very high bar to enter into certain markets and into certain jurisdictions simply because of the regulations. That is the thing that is keeping them out of growing even more. So you have these two ends of the spectrum and to really answer those two questions that I put out there, what regulations apply to me as an institution? And the way I've interpreted those regulations, is it correct and in line with the spirit of the regulation? And just to give an anecdote, typically the latter question to address, you, each organization has to do, usually comes up with their own bespoke way of interpreting the regulations. So the regulators come in and they spend a good solid six to what, six months to one year doing an examination to ascertain has that regulation been implemented in the correct way and in the intended way and the, with the intended outcomes. So it's not an efficient process and it's a huge, how can I put it, anchor on the entire industry as a whole. So this is where really open source comes into its own. And I think it plays a really pivotal role and it's the, and the timing, you know, everyone's talking about the timing being critical here. So, and, and the story of open data standards for two things come into play. Regulatory ontologies and taxonomies, that's number one. And number two is coupled with this, how do we have a standardized mechanism of semantically linking those regulatory ontologies with the descriptions of the firms themselves, an ontology of the firm, if you will. So those two, two concepts and the latter one is really important here. So let me break this down. So it's uh, everyone's on a level playing field. So I'm not gonna assume everyone knows what an ontology is. So I'm just gonna quickly, at a high level, it allows us to um, create relationships between different data types or objects in the context of an information architecture. And ontologies are typically more versatile than say a taxonomy, which is typically hierarchical. So ontologies can tell you sideways relationships. They can embed more complex rules-based re uh, relationships and so on. So it gives you a much more richer framework in order to be able to um, maintain those relationships and keys. But I want to start by saying ontologies are nothing, there's nothing new about regulatory ontologies. I'm betting that most of you would have come across a regulatory ontology or seen someone speaking about regulatory ontology. So, and, and the objective isn't to recreate the wheel. So that's super important. Um, <clears throat> and, and just as an example, we've been talking to FIBO, for example, about the regulatory ontologies that they've been building out in the industry. But where the value proposition comes in, and this is the hard bit, is how do you semantically link those regulatory ontologies to 
how you describe an organization or a financial institution. That's the key. And that is the, that is the complex bit, and, but the value proposition of what, we're, um, what we want to talk about here. So let me kind of, what I've just said there, break it down into a value proposition in, in a, at a high level. Imagine we had an engine and you have two inputs going into that engine. One is your regulatory text or maybe a standardized way of representing your regulatory text. The other is a way of, or a standardized way of describing your financial institution that goes into your engine where you have your open data standard, which then links these two semantically. And then that is where you come to a position where you don't get into the business of trying to interpret something, but you can focus on higher value proposition items like, okay, this is what I need to calculate. This is what I need to report on. Right? And that's the premise of what we're proposing um, in this presentation. Now, as I had mentioned, open source is the game changer here. And as, as an anecdote, um, in Deutsche Bank, where I work, um, we, we have these innovation forums. And I remember about a year ago, actually, uh, one of our colleagues, he came up with the idea, you know what, this would be a great idea if we had this regulatory ontology, we built it in our organization, and we, uh, we could you know, really simplify things. And interestingly, he, he actually won the innovation award, but it didn't have much traction post winning that award. And the reason why was that very quickly it dawned on everyone is, this is hard. This is actually really hard to do. There's so many regulations. The size of the problem is so complex. How do you do it? So, and I'm willing to bet a lot of other institutions have thought about this idea, but just didn't pursue it simply because of the size and gravity of what that entails. So, and frankly, it's not a revenue generator at the end of the day either. So why would we? It's been far too easy for individual institutions to just get a whole bunch of very smart, bright quants, methodology guys, focus on our legal guys, focus in on the regulation and do a point in time solution to get over that hurdle and move on to move on to business as usual. So that, that's really been the modus operandi. And if and let, let's talk about vendors as well. This, this is an interesting paradigm. Vendors have tried to create a, I guess, a more proprietary IP within their products. I'm not going to name any inst uh, vendor uh, vendors here, but you know, there's many that most of you will know where they provide out of the box templates, but I'm yet to come across a solution where you can easily integrate your input data to that vendor product. That's where you always get stuck. And that's where a lot of our investment and time goes in. So this is where open data standards, we believe come to the rescue because it's by the very nature of the pro problem, it's a horizontally scalable um, item. So, and, and I think this is interesting that we should uh, reflect on a bit because not all open source uh, solutions are easily horizontally scalable. And what I mean by that is there may be some um, open source items that you put out there, but it has a very high bar in terms of getting to understand the core framework or the code base at a sufficient level of depth before you become productive to extend it out. That's a natural thing. But with something like an open data standard, you don't have to solve the entire problem in one go. You can incrementally build on it, depending on the jurisdictions, the different regulations, the different aspects of the regulations, and you can incrementally add. And that's where the value proposition of opening this up as a open data standard in an open source context really comes into its own. And another interesting thing, we were discussing this, and we we're saying actually there, there's actually other things that open up here as well. For example, niche regulations where, um, you know, one of my colleagues, he works, he used to work in a Swiss bank and he was saying, yeah, in Swiss banking, you have all these really niche, you know, FINMA based regulatory things that unless you're a Swiss bank, very few other banks would want to get into that business because it's just too much overhead. It's not worth it. But imagine you had a platform and an ecosystem like this driven by this common framework an ontology where people could add things on and they started adding these niche ones on as well. It starts to open up an entirely new market for a whole bunch of, uh, a whole segment of the organization and not just for retail and wholesale banking. Even if you think about emerging markets, that's an opportunity as well. So it starts to open up a lot of doors, which I think are really interesting and worth reflecting on. So, so what? 
what is the so what of why do we want to do this and the value proposition of an open source thing that we all jointly want to collaborate on. Why does this make our lives better? So there's three value proposition pillars that um, we've identified and we want to articulate. The first one is really industry image and integrity. So one, I don't think it's any secret that financial institutions and regulators, it's been a bit of a chess game where the uh, financial institutions have been ways, finding ways of trying to game the regulations themselves in their own interest. No secret. We want to avoid that though, in reality. Secondly, it promotes transparency of how we do things. And I think the standardization element is key. Today we don't have standardization. It's pretty much each bank goes into their own little silo, comes up with a solution, as I mentioned, big exam process. Okay, they tweak it. There are more complex aspects where banks may lobby together because they find a certain aspect of the regulation is just not practically feasible. And I think here, creating that transparency and standardization is fundamental because it also has an impact on how we operationally interact with the regulators. And I'll come on to this in a moment, but really, we can streamline the processes by which we interoperate with regulators to understand the spirit of are we truly implementing the regulations with the desired outcomes that the regulators had in mind. And I think that is, a, and I'll come on to that in a moment. And overall, I believe having something that's standardized, it reduces the impact of reputational risk on individual firms. So you have a systemic um, robustness that you introduce into our industry, which I think is a good thing. Um, the second aspect is around uh, the operating model. So I mentioned that we can start to streamline things with the regulators, but in terms of the overhead within financial institutions, you start to slim that out because you have something that's standardized. You have people contributing to that rather than everyone trying to solve that in their individual silos. And so it's a cost reduction effort within the industry as well. It's an efficiency play for the industry. And moving to the other end of the spectrum, as I mentioned with the fintechs, the smaller boutique firms, you start to create a framework where they can leverage common things for them to enter into markets they couldn't before, right? And really this is the foundational element that could help us on that flight to level up the playing field and really create a vibrant reg tech, fintech ecosystem. And as I mentioned, both can then focus on higher value proposition items like the calculations, like the reporting. So that's in terms of the operational elements of how it starts to change things. And then finally, in terms of uh, the final value proposition pillar, is combating systemic monopolies. So I'm willing to bet that there are big data organizations out there that are looking to build out their own version of this. And what we want to avoid is, particularly for regulatory items, that we are then attached to one or two big uh, data providers to try and solve problems like this. One, it, it introduces a form of indirection in terms of for the regulators themselves to try and understand are people complying with the actual regulations. Two, for the financial institutions themselves by the very nature of monopolies, you have to pay, a, you get a financial hit. You have less um, optionality in the market, and the, these firms will charge us for it. So from an antitrust perspective, we're promoting, you know, moving away from that whole aspect. So those are the three big value propositions that we're um, putting out there. But the other element that I think goes hand in glove with this entire topic, it's not just a IT tech or data thing. Governance and operational model is super important, especially when we're talking about open sourcing a regulatory linked objective. You know, we have to think about the, um, the governance model for this. And I don't think we have one yet. I'll be open and transparent to everyone. This is a learning curve that we need to go through. But as we build out, as I mentioned, the outcome of those two questions of how do we semantically link the uh, regulatory ontology with the financial firm's description, in parallel, 
we need to also build out that operational governance framework. It goes hand in hand, and you can't do the two separately, and it's super important. Interestingly, so <clears throat> I, was, I was reading the um, digital regulatory reporting paper published by PA Consulting on behalf of the FCA and the Bank of England on how they want to automate and introduce machine-readable uh, regulatory reporting. Um, and in that paper, they actually articulate a framework for assessing the efficiency of an operating model for governing such things. <clears throat> and on, on a side note, I actually think if you don't have something like this, that paper's objective becomes very, very difficult, by the way. But in terms of the operating model, first thing is stakeholders. And, and this is something that we've been reflecting on quite a lot. Stakeholders are fundamental. And again, this goes back to the antitrust point. We have <clears throat> the regulators themselves. We have the regulated firms. We have legal firms, advisories that are involved. And you have vendors. And each one has slightly differing um, concerns and perspectives of their position in the market. And really from an operational and governance perspective, how do we be inclusive of all of them so that we are not falling into the trap of antitrust, all of these things? How do we bring them all into the fold to work together on this? That's number one. There are other elements. As I mentioned, horizontal scalability. The fundamental principle of this is horizontal scalability. You don't get that, this doesn't work. So how do we make sure we monitor that horizontal scalability, bringing people into the fold? How do we get that collaboration? How do we monitor that collaboration? Make sure that there is that continuous iterative process from all the contributors. <clears throat> Time to market, that hopefully is an obvious thing when a new regulation comes. How does this structure address that in a timely fashion for the regulators and for the uh, regulated firms? And then finally, operational risk. And the operational risk part is actually very interesting. And it goes back to the point about one of the value proposition pillars, where potentially we have the opportunity here to create a real-time feedback loop with the regulators. Rather than try and interpret the regulations up to a certain point, then go back in a very batchy way, it's slow and it's cumbersome. If we can create a real-time loop with the regulator saying, is this right, the way we're starting to define the ontologies? Is this what you mean? We can start to create a more systemic efficiency into our process where the regulators, we tick their box, but also from the regulated firms, it makes it a lot more clearer, transparent, and easier for them to follow through on what they need to do. And we remove that uncertainty that exists in the execution process of implementing regulations within these organizations. So that, I do think, is a game changer in the way we would do things. And, and if you think about things like machine readable regulations, all of that, all of that really comes into its own and, and is really a, a game changer in, in terms of the operational model for the industry as a whole. So, as I said, and um, I want to introduce uh, James and Sarah, who I've been working very closely with uh, from Braithwaite and uh, ChangeGap. Um, we're asking, we need people to get involved. And as you can see, I mean, I'm going to move on to really a, on this slide. You can see we have already <coughs> engaged with many, many parties and we're in, you know, either they're involved or we're in discussions with them. And, and really this is not about trying to build our own thing on one side. The success of this is really about how do we bring the industry together? And, you know, we're looking to Finos themselves. We're looking to various other parties. How do we come together, participate, build this out? Because the timing, we believe, is key now. Everyone is talking about this. And if we action this, we can be part of something which is quite game-changing in its uh, nature. So I'll stop there. I'll leave this slide on there. And uh, I'll open up to any Q&As. And James and Sarah will also help me on that aspect. But thank you very much for listening. Sorry, please.
when is something material to one LE and not to another, or you know, to the, whichever regulator? I mean, it's really difficult. Is, it, you, is that part of the discussion? It's like, so, what level do we take? I mean, James, do you want to yeah, take look, that? I'll, I'll take this one. Um, so, I think we, we deliberately set out two key questions here. Um, one is what regulation applies to my firm, and the other is then how do I. Um, the core focus of phase one is to uh, is to be able to articulate the what. So, in this sense, we're looking at legal entities. We're looking at the licenses that they hold, the products that they offer to the market, the services they offer, and based on that, being able to define okay, this is the list of regulation regulatory obligations that apply to this firm. You then have a whole second order question of okay, given now I understand what applies to me, how do I re reply to that? Um, you know, we could as I say, we could boil the ocean. We could spend years and years and years working on this. I think at the type of entity, the type of license, the product category, you can answer the what and provide a lot of value to the industry relatively quickly. Um, there are lots of people who've done bits of this already. There are solutions out there that um, we can leverage for, for parts of this. Um, and then, you know, as Tanya has been saying, the, the real objective here is to crowdsource the wisdom of everybody here and all of your organizations to then take each domain, and you know, when I say domain, I mean types of firm, sectors of the industry, types of product, and really deepen the, the knowledge graph. You know, and this is, it's being built on a graph technology that allows us to scale horizontally to basically to leverage the, the input of, of the industry. Yeah, we're building a knowledge graph, um, a semantic model of the, the firm and of the regulatory world and linking the two and you know, we've had some great conversations with some regulators already who are doing great work in terms of uh, digitizing the rule books, but that's still no use if you don't have a semantic representation of the firm. So we're building a framework to represent firms and a framework for regulation and the, the model, the ontology that links the two of them, uh, but it, it really is a framework and we're looking for the industry to come and, and help us to, to deepen, to build out every single domain. Graham. Oh, cheers. Uh, do I have to stand up? <laughs> so no, yeah. okay. You've semi, yeah, James, you've semi answered my question. My question was, was this. Um, you, you talked about how the, the most important thing of all is this kind of interface or glue, if you like, or adapter between the regulatory ontology and the bank's own ontology. Uh, we're, we're currently engaged to try and define an ontology for a large financial services institution for their own stuff, yeah, whose logo, interestingly, isn't on your slide here. So uh, hopefully we can add value in some way in the future. But the question is this, you know, as far as I can tell, most banks don't even have an ontology of their own stuff, never mind joining it up and adapting it up in a clever way to a regulatory ontology. So my question is, you know, how applicable is what you're doing for firms that haven't even figured out their own stuff, never mind joining it up to the regulatory report, except in an ad hoc way. Yeah, just, just to say actually, um, in terms of the scale of this um, and needing to uh, prove it can work and, and to make it happen, because this really is a, a bit of a burning platform and there's a limited time window in which you know, we need to get this going. So um, we're looking for parties to work with us so that we can do proofs of concepts. So we very much have the global vision. Um, there's a timing thing here, as Tanium said. Um, there's lots of work that has been done that we can leverage. Um, uh, but in order to make it real and to deliver that incremental value, uh, that's where we need firms, regulators and vendors uh, to work with us. Um, and, you know, that's a good case in point because you know, why should everyone have to come up with their own ontology? Why should everyone have to uh, do the interpretation? You know, so one current example is the uh, investment uh, uh, management industry. So there's uh, about three and a half thousand firms just in the UK getting to grips with uh, IFBR, which is an adaptation of CRR. Um, so three and a half thousand firms doing their own interpretations. It's crazy. Um, so, yeah, I think the proofs or concepts will be really key. Uh, so having set out uh, the vision here and partnering with Finos, uh, but also, as James said, you know, with the regulators um, uh, and people like EDM Council, you know, there's so much good work going on. And if we don't all work together, 
uh, and sort of divide and conquer, then we're just going to be in this perpetual will. And, and on, on the title slide, there was a statistic, um, I think it was a Bloomberg statistic that said $55 billion um, dollars, uh, is the projected value of the reg tech industry by 2025. And a huge amount of that investment um, by individual firms or people investing in them is potentially going to be wasted because they're developing their own proprietary taxonomy ontologies. Sarah, how many people have got this vision? So how many competing visions are there? Well, there's probably a lot. And, and I think, um, um, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of people saying, oh, it's just all too difficult, or, or someone else has got it doing it. Um, got a like a finos umbrella structure where we can work with and you know get people corralled together and yeah this is the opportunity i mean you know like yeah you're absolutely right there are probably lots of people trying to do pockets of activities around the place but and it's not just financial it, services yeah. the en energy industry is uh, really yeah. struggling if we can identify those visions mm. absolutely yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, the, the horizontal scalability point is huge here. We will set out the framework in which others can then collaborate and bring all that energy together to solve the problem. We, you know, even if we spent the next five years, all of us in this room working on it, we wouldn't be able to solve all of this. We need the whole industry to come together, but we do need that framework. This, this is to Graham's point. We need at least a framework because a lot of firms look at it and think, I want to do it, but it's a bit too difficult. I, you know, why isn't there a standard out there? How is this question of Finos really, but how is this fitting into the Finos structure when you've got the Greg and Services, you know, working with, with, with Rosetta and, and that's very different to what this is. Mm. Yeah, so we're, we, you know, we're, we're working really with them, yeah. 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 Is it a different SIG or is it still part of the same? No, 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 so we're still part of the Reg SIG yeah. forum, so we all met in the Reg SIG forum yeah. actually. Yeah, yeah. Ex yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And we're trying to connect them by use cases. Um, so we've discussed with a couple of firms and um, vendors about choosing a use case that has relevance across, and that's how you can compare and validate the work. Yeah, because what's interesting is I know, again, talking to this one person here, but I can't keep our MD, MDs interested long enough to talk about these things. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I've missed the fact that this is another project within that. So they've gone to the meetings, they've seen, oh, I'm already progressing this through the mm. Rosetta you know, meetings. Yeah. Well, you are for, a, for this little... Yeah. Sorry, Russell, do you want to say something? Yeah, I, absolutely. I think the the 
the framework that we're conceiving in sort of the first phase or two of this is very much top of house what applies to me, but the, the extensibility is huge. You know, all of the work you're doing through Waltz and uh, so the, the legend language for uh, codifying the firm's, so the, the firm's operations can all be brought in here to expand the, the, the graph of the firm to get a richer connection to what applies to me, and what can I do? Um, you know, Simon, the, if you get down to each individual instrument, particularly some of the exotic instruments, you get into, you know, millions of combinations. Um, you know, we're not going to do that on round one, but as, you know, if we're able to crowdsource the wisdom of the industry, we will eventually be able to build that richness. Yeah, I think if we can get a, a common language for describing firms, that opens up the ecosystem, I want to say Sarah's favourite terms, opens up the ecosystem for, for all sorts of vendors, whether they're reg tech, fintech, whatever um, sort of technology to, to communicate using a, a shared understanding of the firm. Yeah, I mean, every vendor we've spoken to has said, if you know, as soon as you've got something in the space, let us know. But they don't have the time or funds necessarily to, you know, try and do this. So ecosystem definitely is the right thing. Um, the other thing that Tanya, you mentioned, is the operating model. So we've um, kicked off a conversation around this because even if we, you know, come up with the most amazing data standard and everyone loves it and agrees with it, how's it going to stick? You know, adoption is key. And we can't wait until you know we're sort of a long way through this to start that conversation. So there's a few good examples in the industry, like um, OBIE um, and a couple of others. So we're sort of looking at those and thinking what would be a workable model. And if we can get some um, critical mass around that, then they can be evangelising and getting people not only to get involved but to start the adoption journey. And be maintained, be maintained as the industry evolves. Yep. Yes. What's the kind of general sentiment from the regulators in, in industry firms trying to come together and collaborate on this? Is it sort of a stigma, per se, in that, you know? Quite the opposite. Uh, actually, a huge pull. Um, so, uh, Tanya mentioned the uh, digital regulatory reporting work that the FCA and the Bank of England have been doing over the past couple of years. Um, you know, our engagement so far with the Bank of England in particular has been very positive because you know, regulators understand that they can't, their knowledge of firms is far poorer than the firm's knowledge of themselves. So they, I think there's an encouragement for firms to come together and where there's no competitive considerations, and I don't think that this is a competitive consideration, to form common languages, common ways of describing their businesses, and you know, where interpretations are, can be shared, then that's, that's a good thing. You know, if, it, if they have the same business and the same risks, they should be applying the same regulation. I think that's, that principle is pretty well established. Um, so no, I think quite the opposite. It's a, a real pull for, yeah, encouragement from the regulator to say, yes, we'd love to see the industry come together and do this. And, I, and hopefully the quid pro quo is that we get regulators who start publishing uh, content in machine readable initially and eventually machine executable formats that we can consume as the other part of the equation. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think really the key here is to try and visualize this as a, we're trying to create a systemic efficiency in our industry as a whole. And that's really the fundamental element of this. And we don't have that systemic efficiency. So how do you do that? And that, that's really the crux of it. And I think it, it's, not a, it's not an efficiency that's independent to the regulators. The regulators are a part of that. And I think the regulators see the value proposition in that. I mean, I know Sarah's been talking to people in the Bank of England, et cetera. So there's absolutely a lot of interest in it. In yeah, that. and I think it's um, a lot of people like to say, oh, the regulators aren't support or won't support. Um, but I, I personally feel that um, the industry needs to work together and bring things to them that they can support. You know, they're not going to support something that is not there or is not well formed. So I think it's literally two sides coming together. Yeah. Sure. Uh, do we have Rob? It's a good question. I think it's, like I said, it's, it's a timing thing because, uh, as a lot of you will be aware, regulations have grown in complexity over time. And you need, I think, a bit of a kick up the butt, to, to, to put it bluntly, in terms of that complexity level to say, hang on, this is, just being a, this is just a pain now to do. We need to do something. That's one dimension. The other dimension is, I think, individual firms didn't have a channel to tap into to say, how do we kind of pull this together and work together in a consistent framework? And again, you know, as we mentioned, working with Finos and the various people around here, we're starting to get that framework at the industry level to start to channel the efforts in and do this as a collaborative thing. Yeah. So I think the combination of those two things really are starting to, and that's why we've been emphasizing the timing aspect that this is the right time. Let's, let's strike out on this now based on those two parameters. Yeah, I, th I think since the financial crisis, so yeah, I say it's only 13 years ago, but it, it's a relatively short time. And, and you know, since then, uh, firms have got to this point of thinking it, it's, it's becoming intractable. But you've also had a lot of reg tech and fintech activities. So, um, and, and that's where the crunch point is coming. Um, so um, I, I think that's the aspect. But equally, there's a, there's a limited time window. If there's not solutions fast, then... Um, the, yeah, be an opportunity missed. It's an exciting time, definitely. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.